think that all of those, I mean, you're talking about post-postmodern and the mm. tradition and this and that, but there are a lot of readers who aren't really, who haven't yeah. been schooled in either of those areas. Do you think that the fact that you feel like your poetry has to be so aware of, of all of this history of poetry mm -hmm. would make it inaccessible? To, we, I mean, do you ever worry about that or? Well, for me, accessibility, uh, although I know that this is just a terrible thing to say and have on record, hmm. but for me, accessibility has actually always been really important. You know, however much I'm interested in experimentalism, and I'm really interested in it, particularly in a linguistic level, you know, I, I don't, you know, I don't feel any of that, any much of anything that happened in the 20th century is inaccessible to readers. I think that it's, you know, for a variety of cultural reasons, things that they don't try to access and aren't perhaps particularly interested in accessing, but there's nothing, you know, like Susan Howe isn't hard, and Susan Howe is really beautiful, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, there's, there's nothing that any reader, you know, you can read that stuff. You can read language poetry. You can read, you know, uh, a lot of avant-garde work. Um, for me, the idea has always been to take that awareness, you know, and make it work in a way that I would like to think anybody could pick it up and read, um, you know. And so, and that's in a lot of ways where I feel, at least in my own work, um, where the tradition and you know my deep and abiding love of you know all things avant-garde sort of meet and kind of duke it out. You know, I want both to work. Um, do you, do you feel that in your own work? Yeah, I mean, I I do. I I feel like uh, in a way. I mean, when we're talking about accessibility, I feel like poetry should be as clear as the poet is in their mind or mm -hmm. their heart. Sure. And sometimes that's not clear. So I think, I mean, in a way, I feel like I'm like I don't want to create a false space in which I am more certain. Like I don't think right, that accessibility right. should mean yeah, like yeah, dogma yeah. or certainty. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I would hope that somebody could come to my poem and, or a poem of mine and, and, and feel, even if, even if there wasn't like a, a direct narrative, you know, I wasn't telling a story in the way that somebody might have come to expect from a certain kind of literature, mm -hmm. that there were, emotions or ideas or images that were clear clear enough to reach somebody mm -hmm. um, so so yes yeah, so, I mean I, I definitely think I think that um, in a way we're back to this idea of morality you know that yeah, there's yeah. like you that I strive to be as clear as I can to myself um, mm -hmm. and as clear as language can be um, and uh, and so I don't think there should ever be a trickiness or like a a willful, what would the mm. word be, like obfuscation. Um, right, right, yeah, yeah. But, uh, but, but within that, I think, like, the world is pretty complicated. Yeah, So, yeah. you know, there, there, I think that a little bit of, of work on the part of the reader, work on the part of the poet, I think is, is okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that, that, I think that obscurity and obfuscation and clarity um, can be used together, you know, and yeah. it, they can heighten each other um, in a way that I think is really, you know, useful for the reader. I mean, I think that that's actually, a lot of what I do, or try to do in poetry, I, I actually get from music, and that's been happening in music for the past, particularly popular music, uh, the past 20 years or so. Those, those two have been really, since the Jesus and Mary chain, to be uh, <laughs> perfectly honest and direct, really since that kind of like just shearing terrible noise with these sort of Beach Boys type melodies came together, and you had to deal with both at once, because Jesus and Mary chain were both avant-garde and very traditional. Um, it, people have sort of recognized that you know they heighten each other, um, and so I think that's a I think that's a good awareness to take it to poetry, you know about <laughs> anything you do in life you cross that sure. nerd line and you know yeah and and yeah I like what you're saying about the nerd line you know that it, you're you're becoming like a poetry nerd or a football nerd, um, but you know and and not to sound too hippy dippy but <laughs> I like to think of it as like a spiritual thing to yeah do. yeah like yeah you're, like it's like a devotion you know you're you're I mean poetry is I think a very humanist you know I, I don't think it has to be about a higher power um, but writing a poem I mean it is a kind of a supplication it's like a humanist supplication so you're devoting yourself to that and I mean anybody I think it's great for anybody to kind of have some experience with that but I do think at a certain point you you either you know you become Shane saying a nerd and I'm saying a cult member you know, <laughs> yeah. there you have it yeah Nerds and cult members. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it seems like it seems like a lot of uh, people in the in the kind of electronic dance music scene are kind of really in touch with that too. Mm -hmm. they, they, it's like it's like a whole like 
way of being. Totally. Yeah. Well, the other thing, I mean, is you're, you're tapping into these, like, rhythms and sounds yeah. and all of this stuff that, that are part of, like, our human core. You know, you've got the heartbeat, you've got the pulse, um, the seasons, all of that kind of stuff. So I feel like some people come to that through verse and some through music and some through whatever else, you know, through athletics. But I do feel like all of that, I mean, it's kind of turning what's all, turning like the chaos that's already all around us into a kind of ceremony, you know, into mm -hmm. something beautiful, yeah. like kind of channeling, channeling that, like the rhythms that are already in that chaos into something. Speaking of ceremony, I suppose this gets into like, um, you know, the, the sort of how you write, you know, some people are like 10 a.m. Mm -hmm. every day. Yeah, Sarah, you know, and then like, do you know, like I prepare my tea and then I take uh, my tea bag out after two and a half minutes yeah. or is it like, you know, which and maybe now you're feeling a little more because you said you want some of these occasion poems. You're like, you know what? 10 a.m. tea thing not working for me now. No. Like a bird just yeah. flew into my hair. <laughs> now I'm yeah. going to write. Yeah, that's more where I'm at right now. Like yeah, I said, yeah. I mean, I had two years where I was like on it, just on it all the time. Um, and now, no, I... My, um, I feel like in a way writing for me is more about like constant attention and readiness than yeah. it is about the act of putting exactly. a word on the exactly. paper. Exactly. I feel like I always have my notebook. I'm always looking at the world through mm. poetry um, and, and, and then, you know, the actual poem happens or it doesn't. Yeah, this is a, a, a thing that actually I feel kind of it's a big deal for me because a lot of people, particularly when you first get to the workshop, a lot of people have their rituals and they talk about it. But I think ritualizing the act of writing is extremely dangerous to being a writer because I think it is really easy to make the ritual the art and you don't even notice it. You oh, know, okay. Uh, when I, like when I you know first turned like twenty, I used to wake up at a certain time. I used to do a certain thing with my typewriter. All this kind of nonsense. And it, what what ends up happening is when you've you know got yourself ready to write, you already feel like you've sort of done it. You're like, I've done all of my ritual steps. I almost feel like I've written because that's what I do when I write, you know. And so I realized that that's not going to work. It, it you substitute the ritual, f it starts to take on the feeling of the act, right? And then you're not really doing it anymore. So I had to give all that stuff up. And also having you know children at a very young age helped. Um, and so uh, you know children won't let you do that. And so, you know, it got to the point where I just, you know, write poems as I walked down the street or in class. Um, that the, the, the longest poem in that chapbook that you read, uh, One Neither One, I wrote while I was working at a law firm. They were paying me $2,300 a week when awesome. I wrote that poem. Wow. That's, that work. probably made you the highest paid poet <laughs> yeah. in yeah. the country. For that, right for that, for that minute, yeah. uh, I wrote that while I was doing work. So, I mean, you know, I, I, I think that when you don't have to do that ritual stuff, it actually sort of allows you to be, like you were saying, Doris, sort of attentive to everything. And oh. I think that's really the, the best way to work, at least for me. And I got to say, I think it's probably different for, for prose writers than for mm. poets. Yeah. Because if you got to, like, crank out a certain sure. number of words, you kind of have to make yourself sit down and do it. Um, mm -hmm. So in a way, it's, it's a luxury, and I feel like, I mean... There's, uh, you know, Bruce Lee's, like, the art of fighting without fighting, you know? And <laughs> so this is kind of like the art of writing without writing, you yeah, know, where, yeah. like, all of your thoughts, yeah. like, all the stuff you're not putting on paper is kind of building up <clears throat> to what you end up crafting. Um, so, so, yeah, I think there's, I, I mean, maybe I'm in denial, but I think there's more going on, it. you know, inside before a poem manifests itself on paper. Yeah, sure.